Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good afternoon, Dr. Marzwan. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Good afternoon, Dr. Marzwan. We can hear you. Please let me know if you can hear me. Yes, Dr. Marsman, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. And you can see a slides. Yes, we can see them. Thank you so much and good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Hello and thank you for taking your evening time to join the CME lecture. Welcome to the third talk on the quality improvement series in a joint CME program by Larkin Community Hospital and Florida Medical Association. I thank Larkin and FMA for supporting us in planning these credited lectures. I'm Simo Marsban, physician, PhD in health system administration and MPH in healthcare leadership with more than two decades of experience in clinical practice, academic research, teaching, and executive responsibilities. Okay, let's start with talk about the sad time that we live in, but let's congratulate March 8th, International Women's Day, and I hope that Ukrainian mothers and daughters will soon be able to build their homes freely in their homeland away from dictators, violence, and war. Happy Mother's Day, happy Women's Day to all of you, all of uh, people who joined this meeting today. In a summary of what happened in the last lectures, we discussed finding quality gaps in the clinical setting in the first lecture. Our first lecture topic was how to find quality gaps, how to develop topics for our quality improvement projects. And in the second lecture, we looked into strategies to internalize the continuous improvement culture in the clinical workplace before initiating a quality improvement project because culture welcoming culture for quality improvement is something that we need before de developing the projects and our efforts for quality improvement. To make these lectures different from routine presentations on the quality improvement that everywhere happens, we use the, we reviewed practical examples in the profession of medicine instead of concepts and theories. So that was the difference between these lecture series and the others with practical examples, with many illustrations, pictures, and views from best practices around us in other hospitals in the literature. And today, as the third uh, lecture, we start creating a mind map and a written diagram for crucial drivers and change strategies that helps clinicians with a quality improvement plan. So we want to start quality improvement project from this, from this lecture, how to map uh, a driver diagram, how to map our activities for quality improvement project because last two lectures, we built infrastructure for it with the culture, continuous quality improvement culture and how to build the uh, infrastructure and teams for the quality improvement. This lecture, we want to drive, we want to draw a map. We want to draw a plan for uh, drivers and strategies before starting planning for the quality improvement projects. It's an opportunity to share and learn more about quality improvement driver diagram, driver diagram and embedding continuous use of evidence as supportive data for clinical decisions and how to uh, develop our capacity for proper use of IT potential 
uh, IT potential is very important as the backbone of the quality data, the role of interprofessional teams and advanced approaches to patient engagement with quality improvement. And these are learning objectives of this meeting that understanding nonlinear interconnectivity of various factors, nothing is linear in, in the healthcare systems, delivery systems. Um, that's not similar to cause and effect for medical conditions, biologic phenomena. Everything is nonlinear, uh, interconnected and complex and how to integrate evidence and end users views into the change design. Those are important, end users views and opinions and also the evidence are two components that we should integrate into our change designs and interdepartmental and interprofessional teams. Data measures, EMR capacity and e-health technologies are important for us to design for a change planning and change driver mapping. In the left side image, you can see that the quality of patient care is a function of the rules and mechanisms of the organization and how the organization is a function and the result of the surrounding regulation, policies and procedures, and also the market environment, the surrounding environment around us, competitors, suppliers, policy developers, insurers, medical associations, and many, many other uh, stakeholders. In the graphs on the right side, you can see operational room, hospital care is affected by dozens of factors, none of which are linear, but there is a simultaneous effect of set of factors. This teaches us that to change, we need to consider a set of factors. And the fact that by adding an activity, adding a form or a person, we are not able to make serious changes. So that's a wrong uh, presumption to think that if we add this trigger tool, if we add this guideline, this form or a checklist or a label or this orientation meeting or education meeting, we can make a serious change. It's wrong. We, we should consider a trained collaborative team. We should consider the culture, the dominant culture of our system uh, and support from culture that is dominant in the workplace, in the clinical setting is very important. We should include leadership factors. We should include programs and mechanisms, tools and the supportive uh, systems such as IT and appropriate technology uh, and the most important, um, a favorable culture for positive changes to be visible in the patient side, to change something that is visible in the patient side, we need to include all of those factors simultaneously. And those factors uh, doesn't have, uh, do not have the linear relation together. Uh, as you see, there are um, interactive interconnected relationship together and at the same time many factors affect each other keep this in your mind to be ready for driver mapping for quality improvement project to to show you how we can develop driver maps for quality improvement projects if you remind a part of last presentation we need a name a statement for every quality improvement project in the aim statement on the left side of the diagram in the aim statement we clarify who is doing what by applying which measurements and changes by when and through what process and activities in order to achieve what aim i will show you in uh, in a slide later how we can develop the aim statement here we didn't have uh, enough um, space for showing all of these together but we should have an aim for our quality improvement uh, project from the left side to the right part of the diagram you see that to accomplish the measurable aim that you designed you develop 
we need to articulate and change several factors that directly pave the way for the proposal. Those are called key drivers. So if you see at the topic of our lecture is key drivers. Key drivers means needed changes, the factors that affect uh, our environment to reach to our aim, to achieve our targets, our goals. To change those factors that we talked about, how these factors are interconnected and relevant to each other in the clinical practice, we need a specific strategies and approaches. So from, from the aim, we should develop some factors, some dri key drivers, primary drivers and secondary drivers. We will talk about it later to clarify everything. And then we need a specific strategies and approaches um, to, to develop those uh, key drivers and then achievement of the aims and targets. And to implement the change strategies, we need tools and resources. So if you remember that the healthcare system is interconnected and it is very complex. We should have several drivers and change strategies and tools and resources to tap an alternative, an aim, a target for our uh, quality improvement projects. And this is only an example. Let us, let us see how this work in our environment environment. This is a simple version of the uh, driver diagram that we have aims. Driver diagram is a one-page summary of your project strategy. It has its driver change ideas and there are areas of factors that you need to change to see improvement. So change ideas are the other parts of this driver diagram. Let us see how it could be very professional. For example, in this, in this quality improvement project, the aim is to improve the quality of care for COPD patients at hospital uh, X. And then for having this aim, planning for uh, changes to um, achieve this goal, we need appropriate provision of clinical care, appropriate discharge. As the general ideas, general strategies for, for reaching to this aim. And then for having those general goals or drivers for this change, we need several changes in our system. For example, to change referral system, to, to have some education and observation, to educate patients, to assess this sustainability of, of the rehabilitation. You see different factors are here, management, education, referral system, uh, rehabilitation, uh, training staff, training patients. So engagement of the staff, organizational engagement and support and many other things that should contribute to change these areas to have this goal as the ultimate goal of the, of the project. So let us see how, how would be the tools and resources for these areas. Patient information leaflet is a resource for these changes. And also care bundles is another, another tool. The staff education sessions and meetings and having ward champions, uh, positive feedback, to champions of quality improvement in our department, in, in our clinic, is something that can drive these change strategies to this aim. And we need some measure, some measures to, to have this change progress and how we can proceed with this plan. So you see that here we are measuring length, length of a stay readmission rate in, in different layers of this plan, of this driver diagram, we have different type of measurements. To be able to claim and to prove that our strategies, our resources are working, are functional for, for this uh, quality uh, project, 
you see, for example, for care bundle, we have number of completed bundles. For, for example, this strategy, we have number of smoking cessation. For number of pulmonary rehabilitation referrals for this one. This is the, the plan, the di driver diagram that we can develop for different layers of a multifactorial and interconnected systems for change. So from now on, if we talk about driver diagram, you know what is a driver diagram for a quality improvement project. And it's not enough to, to bring, for example, a checklist or to develop a educational meeting for our department and, and name it as a quality improvement. It's not enough to, to have the quality improvement by only adding a form or checklist. We should have a plan to change many things that are measurable and at the same time measure something that helps us to prove our success and achievements. In the aim statement after the issue statement, this is the slide that I promised you that we clarify what is aim statement. In each quality improvement project, we need first of all to state the issue. So aim statement would happen after issue statement. What was issue statement? Issue statement was the first lecture, how to find the quality gap and how you gather the facts and data that support the necessity and importance of our project. That's issue statement. After issue statement and stating why this issue and this topic is important to our department, is important to our clinic or hospital, after that, we should have an aim statement. So with aim statement, project team clarifies who will do what and how by when with before and after intervention measurements of what changes what changes are important there to show that how we can develop this change with the driver diagram this is another example of the driver diagram i'm bringing many examples for you to see how you can develop driver diagrams and reach out to a measurable objective that, that is something measurable. So you see here that aim is something measurable. For example, reducing 50% colonization and infection with multi-resistance uh, staph oros by when. So everything is measurable here. By, uh, for, for this change, we need a lot of things to think about it and develop before having that change. Okay. In addition to the drivers that we need for our specific quality improvement, we have six, six fixed rules. So for quality improvement projects, for our efforts in our departments, we need these drivers to be in place. So we should work on every, every single driver that right now I am sharing with you for our quality improvement projects. In addition to these drivers, we should have some specific uh, drivers for our quality improvement project that I showed you examples for that. The first driver is seek, select, and customize the best evidence for use by practice. You see here that without best available evidence, we cannot develop a quality improvement project. Um, some of residents come to my office, to our office, and uh, talk about, for example, adding a form, adding a checklist, adding a plan, adding educational uh, meeting, or didactics for, for quality improvement project. Then I ask them, okay, have you gathered evidence about this change that you are planning to do in your department? And they look at me <laughs> with question, what do you mean? It means that every change that you are planning to do, you need best available evidence around it. For example, if you want to change the terrier system, 
if you want to change a trigger tool for navigating people between, between two uh, phases of the care, to hand over the patient, if you want something to document better in your department, if you want to change something in your IT system to add a form checklist um, or some questionnaire to develop a questionnaire, for example, for satisfaction, for quality of life in your department, it is necessary to search the evidence before designing that change. It is very important to develop your knowledge and insights from best available evidence. So care must be tailored to meet the needs, circumstances, and preferences of individual patients uh, in addition to finding the best evidence. This is called personalized care. So after gathering the information about the change that you want to design, Understanding patient needs and preferences is the other component uh, of improving the quality of care uh, that is called personalized care. Understanding every single patient's situation, health literacy, priorities, social determinants of health, and uh, individual needs for care, and level of you know, understanding of what you are recommending the patient, lifestyle of the patients, everything is important, relevant, but for now, focus on best evidence for use by practice. What would be the change strategies? Remember, we had drivers and then change strategies in our driver diagrams. What are change strategies for customizing the best evidence for use by practice. We can, we can develop and customize and adopt uh, clinical practice guidelines for five to 10 most prevalent conditions in our program. What does it mean? All of us know that there are many practice guidelines available from American Medical Association, from different types of resources around the world. European countries, they have national resources for each country are developing these practical guidelines. But what about our hospital? Do we have access to all of those equipment, medications, and uh, care steps and requirements that are available in practice guidelines? No. None of hospitals have access to all of those care components. So we should have something for our hospital to unify the care, at least for five to 10 most prevalent conditions. This helps us if we update every two years, this local practice guidelines will help us to, to be aligned and compliant with best available evidence. So updating the protocols, updating the practice guidelines and localizing and customizing that and requiring everyone to be to uh, adhere and follow the, those protocols helps us to be, you know, to have the evidence-based care in our department develop a process to search regularly for new evidence. That's very important because not all recommended uh, articles and guidelines are equally useful. We need to search and we need to appraise evidence. And that's a part of our uh, competencies for residents and medical postgraduate trainees to be able to search the evidence but after search, the other competency is how to appraise to find the best reliable and credible evidence. Those are two important competencies among our uh, residents. And um, to continue that driver, we have another strategies. Embed selected evidence and guidelines into clinical information systems. This is what some of our residents bring the idea of order sets for the patients. 
or having uh, a default list of uh, laboratory tests for medical conditions, for a spe a specific medical conditions, to have a default set of orders, to have a default set of, for example, exams, to have a set of uh, laboratory tests and paraclinic tests. So those are the strategies that helps us to comply with the best available evidence and update everything and make it sustainable because when you are working with EMR, you're working with MedHost, for example, and you every day, every single practice, you are experiencing that IT system offers you different types of actions during your care, your patient care. So it is something that internalized that knowledge uh, into your brain. And continuing this way and updating those protocols and those order sets and laboratory tests and actions step by step that is uh, aligned with clinical practice guidelines can make everything sustained in our in our practice uh, daily practices. Inform patients and families about the evidence. That's something that um, some of our you know. Um, prominent faculty are doing right now. I had an experience recently in our hospital in a visit, and I saw that the faculty used the evidence during the talk with patient. He offered, offered the resource, online resource to the patient to use that documents and those information for planning for behavioral change and lifestyle change. And that was really um, interesting for me that Right now, many of our faculty are using this to talk with patients about best available evidence that, that you know empowers the patient to, to get information, the updated information and reliable information from the resources and online sources that the faculty of physician uh, offers that. It's very important and we call it patient education and engagement. Engaging patient with decision-making with um, obtaining adequate information about their medical condition. That's the role that physicians can develop that. And the other strategy is select and customize evidence for practice-wide implementation. And critical appraisal of evidence here is very important. You know, this is a competency. I, I explained that, that after search of evidence, it's critical that clinicians discuss and agree on the value of a body of clinical evidence before they attempt to implement it. Because not all of the evidence are reliable. You know that many people around the world in academic environment are forced to publish something. So those incentives for people to publish something makes many publications not a reliable thing for the for clinical decision, you know. And there are many wrong and not robust methodologies around in, in the literature that we have access to them. And we should develop our capacity to appraise this type of evidence and to select the best one for our clinical decision support. Uh, for daily practices to rely on those uh, documents and those lecture, those articles. So this is a question from you. Please unmute your speaker and reply. In your opinion, what's the best solution to institutionalize evidence-based care in the clinical education and environment? For example, these are some strategies. Evidence-based journal club lecture series followed by case discussions review of evidence projects by clinical team members didactics adoption of clinical practice guidelines localized care protocols engagement of faculty with research cme lectures and credits let me know do these strategies work to institutionalize and internalize evidence into our practice or not? Please.
Yes, I believe so because, um, for example, in didactics or general clubs, if you discuss cases um, or anything evidence-based, uh, people can discuss it and it remains in your memory, right? And then you can, uh, you're more likely to implement it in the future. As Doctor, well. have you had any any experience with evidence-based journal club? A journal club that a team are searching evidence uh, at the same time, and they are bringing and injecting new evidence and new knowledge to the discussions that uh, that, that are in, between the people who are talking. For example, faculty or residents a team of people are searching evidence to inject and bring new knowledge to the discussions. Have you had any, any experience with this? Yes. Does it um, make sense? Is it something feasible? Yes, I think um, Dr. Marsman, I think yeah. um, some, some of the um, departments do have journal clubs. I haven't attended one, but I heard that they have journal clubs where they- We, we, we have journal clubs, Dr. Marsman. Uh, every month, it, it's, uh, I have it in the program, you know, as one of these uh, um, academic uh, activities that are required for graduation, they must at least participate in one. But I think that what Dr. Marsman is more talking about is, is like an evidence-based ones. We did like about maybe several years ago, we did it for like an, a year, you know, including several research fellows and uh, we will meet like for a journal club exactly for that, for evidence base, and we'll discuss a certain, um, you know, activities related to research and, uh, you know, engaging it. It, it, it motivated a lot of po uh, poster presentations and things like that. I don't know if that's where you're going, Dr. Marshall. That's a great idea. Yeah, Thank that's you, Dr. question too. What is really evidence-based journal club? I mean, journal club, just by nature of it, you're usually going over an article that, has evidence, but I think I suspect you mean something different than that. Thank you for your contribution. I mean, for example, a journal club that brings uh, uh, a medical condition as a topic and then invite people to bring different perspectives from articles and evidence that is available in reputable journals at the same time. So that, that's a planned journal club that people bringing new evidence and discuss about different angles of the medical condition discussions at the same time. And there is someone that, for example, in, in the meeting that search the evidence live to, to discuss something that is under question between two faculty or two different members of, of, of the discussion. So those, those are strategies that are available in the evidence and are available in universities that people are bringing different types of articles that are talking pro and against something, you know, and, and not always are, uh, those aspects of the care conditions are similar to each other. We can find many articles that are supporting um, a solution and many other articles that uh, do not support. And there are always discussions for the benefits and risks of different steps of the care and we can call it evidence-based journal club. Thank you so much for your contribution. And sorry, Dr. Mars, for please, please. Yeah, hi. Um, we have monthly journal clubs as well. Uh, out of the 15 residents, we always have one class present five articles and it's with faculty. And it's absolutely a must that they have to have opinionated articles pro or con to support or, or negate those articles. Some of those articles sound wonderful when you read them, but when you look at the evidence that they try to present and the cohorts that they have in that article, it sometimes makes no sense. And so we can bring supporting documents to show that it really is an erroneous article. And I think our residents can just learn from that. It doesn't have to be a spectacular article to learn. Um, so yeah, I agree with you, absolutely. Thank you so much for echoing that voice, doctor. Thank you for your experience and also Dr. Ferreira and other faculty and residents who contributed. That was great part of this lecture that I learned from you. So this is uh, one of the strategies that we can use for our uh, evidence-based discussions. If we 
if we develop uh, a strategy to search the journals in our system. For example, one of, one of the databases that can help us, instead of searching, for example, PubMed, instead of searching Embase, Cochrane, or CDC, this is, this is a tool that provides ability to search uh, available journals that has different article inf influence and confidence. And you can open this part to show the articles. For example, here, I put my search keywords, breast cancer patient reported outcomes. This is a great um, a, and a hot topic, updated topic today for uh, chronic diseases, patient reported outcomes. And I put these search keywords and I found these different journals that have article, different article influence. And I opened that part to show the articles to you that for example, breast cancer journal has these articles relevant to that topic. And uh, these are other available articles that are published in reputable and credible uh, publishers. So this is important how to design a sustainable strategy for searching the journals and find um, topics and keywords with search queries in reputable resources, not by uh, Google search. You know, many of our residents are doing Google search, but we are trying to develop the capacity and competency that Google search is not a scientific search. So you should go to reputable and reliable resources for that. But more than PubMed and more than Cochrane and up to date, there are other uh, databases like Jane that I showed you that you are able to search the evidence with reputable journals. This is the second driver, implement a data-driven quality improvement process. So for starting a quality improvement project, we need to select a consistent and appropriate methodology for quality improvement. And there are a lot of quality improvement approaches and tools. Let's discuss some of those approaches because we don't have enough time to, um, to explain all of them, but model for improvement is one of those approaches. Uh, plan, do, a study, act, PDSA is the same as model for improvement. So this is the tool for model for improvement. Lean is another approach that focuses on efficiency. Six Sigma, another approach. Root cause analysis, RCA, another approach. Failure mode and effect analysis or FMEA is another approach. A3 worksheets, another approach. And we have different tools like run charts, process and workflow maps, cause and effect diagrams. I will show these tools in the uh, fourth and fifth presentation. Just, just to be familiar with that, because everyone has, has a meeting to, to work on it, how, how to draw these uh, tools and how to use the softwares for having those, just to be familiar with the, with the names. So the easiest one is model for improvement. And the, the other strategy is developing interprofessional quality improvement team. I see in our uh, site visit interviews that people who are accredited to are asking us about interprofessional quality improvement teams and quality measures. So what are interprofessional teams? Teams that are consisting from different people from different departments and different professional backgrounds. For example, having nurses inside our teams, having a staff, having people who are working front desk, having educators, having family members and patients in our quality improvement teams, because we need their worldview, we need the, their opinion and um, perspective for quality improvement. If, some, if a resident bring an idea to the department and then they form a team that 
consist of a faculty at the same time, two or three residents, and one or two people from the staff, from the department staff, from administrative people, that would be a good quality improvement team because it shows that something would happen after and something would last in their department as a part of the change and as a part of uh, quality improvement outcomes after this project. Engage care teams and other staff. This is an emphasize that uh, including other people that influence your project outcomes and changing environment and culture inside the department and making the results uh, sustainable is very important. If you involve IT people in your project, that's a positive uh, point of the, uh, and the strength point of the uh, quality improvement project development and select internal quality improvement measures. What are quality improvement measures? For example, um, delayed diagnosis, inaccurate diagnosis, errors, time, maximizing efficiency of care, maximizing pain relief, optimizing care diagnosis, uh, um, sorry, care results and patient health outcomes, maximizing the expected outcomes of our care. Those are quality improvement measures. Also time is something that Satisfaction is the other one. Quality of life among our patients are the, the other component of the quality improvement measures, but we have a lot of clinical quality improvement measures that we will notice it in our uh, presentations later uh, next month. We will discuss what are quality improvement measures in clinical environment and at the same time non-clinical components of the care that are time or satisfaction or something else but we have many clinical things to to measure let's see the list of these approaches and methodologies as you see there are many different methodologies for for quality improvement qu continuous improvement brainstorming five wise process flow diagram, check sheets, checklists, run charts, histograms, and, and many other FMEA, we, we talked about it, PDSA, we talked about it, but I don't want to confuse you with these names. The easiest way is PDSA, plan, do, check, act. And some of the simple tools like this one, what's this? This is a fishbone, fishbone. We experience a problem in our department and we are trying to define and explore different factors that affect the problem. The challenge of this approach is uh, this is linear. And we discussed that nothing in health system is linear because for example, education can affect uh, task factors. Education can affect communication factors. So these are co more complex than the thing that now we can see, but it is a simple tool for understanding different types of factors that affect the problem in uh, patient care. So these are approaches. We will discuss five of these in our lectures later, but just five, not to confuse you with different terms. The driver, the third driver is optimizing health information system. This is very important, dear doctors, because information system empower us and enrich our hand to change the system, to, to change the care as we design in our quality improvement projects, for example, when you are talking about a new examination, when you are talking about a new checklist, when you are talking about documentation of patient views, or when you are talking about measuring a new healthcare outcome inside your department for your patients, that's important to incorporate that change 
in the IT system. Supportive IT system is very important. Electronic health record should be enriched with this quality improvement and generate meaningful reports for us to see how our changes are functional in our departments. What are changes strategies? Having quality measures is important. Learning to use existing untapped EHR functionality. We have a lot of data inside our EHR how we can use those for research purposes, how we can use those for practice improvement. It is very important to use, to use those data for practice improvement. How, if you are able to search the EHR about the topic of your quality improvement project and then gather those data and then analyze the data instead of, you know, develop new questionnaires, developing new surveys by residents that are not always reliable, you know, using the actual data from, from EHR is more beneficial for our purposes for quality improvement. And that's the thing that we are trying in our research department to establish the capacity to work with IT, with IT system. I will show you how we can develop dashboards Creating dashboards are very important. Presenting data visually, because we physicians do not, you know, we, we don't like to, to work with um, data directly. So, but if, if someone shows us in an illustrative way, in a dashboard, how the things are uh, moving forward, and what's the challenge, what is the gap, and what is our achievement? That would be the best one because make anything easy to us for understanding and to, to decide based on those dashboards. I will show you what are dashboards. Improve data accuracy and transparency and secure staff trust because you know having accurate data after measurements are important and we need to document the accurate data and work on the data errors through our quality improvement systems. This is an example of a dashboard. As you see here, we are focusing on patient satisfaction with the uh, test turnaround time, for example, average time for having the result of these tests, the average time. And you know that time is very important for managing the, uh, the patient care and processes. And so average waiting times, average time to see a doctor, to get a treatment, patient falls, or something more than it. We can have, for example, uh, re-ad readmissions. We can have adverse events. We can have infections, nosocomial infections here. We can have bleeding, post-operative uh, wound dehiscence. We can have many other things that, that we want to measure. Pain relief, pain management indicators. We can put everything that we want for our department. These are just examples, but having this dashboard in our IT uh, you know, platform and uh, 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 illustratively shows us what are important for our department. Weekly, we can access to this data and change something based on that. The staff explain procedures and instructions in an understandable way. That's the result, for example, of, of a survey that the department are, is running um, con continuously. And they brought a part of results here as a part of dashboard. This is another dashboard patient experience analysis dashboard. So you can see here patient feedbacks, patient satisfaction, average length by department, average length of a stay by department, average wait time by department, patient feedback by department. So those are things, but, and again, these are things that um, I found. So you can put everything about your department in that. If you're working in surgery department, you can put 
pre-operative circumstances and indicators and post-operative and during operative and many things around that. If you're working in psych department, you can put, for example, quality of life after, after receiving the solutions or treatment or, for example, before, before medications status or many things, engagement of the family, support of the family and many clinical areas to measure here that are important for us in our daily practices. This is another dashboard that you can see again, patient counts by week. This works for hospital managers, but we can put many other things here. For example, patients count by a spe specialization to see how is the productivity of different departments that's managerial. And this is readmission rate per each department to show readmission rate is how in each department, and then we can analyze this. So if we have, for example, repeated visits, if we have uh, not satisfied patients, if we have complaints in our department, or if we have uh, not accurate diagnosis or something that um, we are suffering with that, we can develop this type of dashboards for that. To continue the driver uh, tree, we can talk about link patients to their clinicians and teams. Why? To ease the healing process through on-time communications, to understand information needs for decision inputs to improve health literacy and behavior among our patients and to engage patients in decisions and to empower self-care, medication usage and compliance. So using registries and other data resources are the other strategies. Registries can contribute to national surveillance efforts and um, empower us to do a special researches in a special and specific medical conditions. Uh, we, uh, we are trying now to establish neurosurgery uh, patient registry uh, in conjunction with the national program. So it's very important to document and record the data about the patients and then develop and improve our research projects around a medical condition with a patient registry. Those are strategy strategies let me share this one with you how to link patients to their clinicians and teams with information systems this is the application that many of you are familiar with that software on mobiles application on mobiles that shows everyone um, data personal data and the vital signs hospitalization records and history and appointments with doctors. And, and you see here, for example, the appointment, prescriptions, medications, results of the, of the tests, diagnosis, and providers that who are working on, on the same patient at the same time, consultations from different departments and the results of those. So you see a real time collaboration and communication just using a, a software, using an application that patients and clinical teams have access to that at the same time. This is my chart. It is you know, a, a famous uh, application for the, for the patients who are receiving um, care from universities, medical universities. So you see here, test results, question. This is very important, ask a question. And uh, professional questions, medical questions, uh, you know, empower patients for self-care, for, for efficiency in their care at home. Schedule a patient, request refills, and review health summary, view your account, and e-visits is the other component of that. And you see that how, for example, examination results and visit notes can be accessible here for patients to be a partner for our decision-making and plans. This is another one. 
another platform that shows you many things here, appointments, messages, secure messages between, between physicians and patients are very important to, to be shared on time when a patient have, has some problems and lab results are accessible here, medical records, prescriptions, care plans, and many things. WebMed here is a source of patient education. So you can see that patients can have access to a right source of information here and physician can navigate patient to use, to use this information for specific medical conditions. These are patient communication platforms. And I like this one because here you can see that peers, professional people, patients, and uh, care providers at the same time can have access together. This is a software, an application is called Belong Life. It is a patient professional network between people who have cancer, who have been diagnosed with a type of cancer. Everyone can be a part of this network and they can have access to professional people like, for example, immunotherapy oncologists here. They can have uh, access to, you know, different type of people who can, radiation oncologists, these are professional ones, gynecologists. So I, I um, uh, registered in this community to see how it works <laughs> for, for having a direct, for example, a direct experience with this software, I registered myself. And I see here that people are sharing their real life their real life experiences with cancer, about different problems that they have with cancer in a real life. And they are asking physicians there and they are sharing good news together. They are learning from peers. And you know that peer learning is a very strong learning that patients learn from other patients, how to manage, how to overcome barriers and challenges and sad times together and how to be able to to battle the cancer and at the same time they are receiving professional con consultancy and recommendations and uh, when you begin to 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 register for this software it asks you a com informed consent for the research as well so they are using this big data for research purposes at the same time you see there is a huge potential in IT system and in softwares and applications to, to link patients with professionals and then use the actual data that happens for patients during a care process for, for a chronic uh, disease like cancer. This is a huge capacity in this type of communications. Driver, the other driver is create and support high functioning care teams. And I explained that it is very important to include many people who have a type of influence in, in your quality improvement in your department, not only residents, but faculty, patients, supervisor, nurses, and administrative people those people can make your changes sustainable, even if your change plan is only clinical change in your department, but those people guarantee the success for your project and making last the, the, change, the changes and improvements in your daily practices. So review the performance and make participating in quality improvement activities part of everyone's roles and responsibilities for evaluating please please yeah because um when we get into these everyone uh talks about the uh benefits of these could a quality ensure uh improvement talk about the negative impact of some of these on the physician because some of these patients and i i know many of us have gone through this you it becomes almost as if they expect this to be a personal portal and they're giving you multiple questions and then get upset if you don't answer 
within a certain time uh, as because um, a lot of them have much more time than you do to be on this. And so while I certainly see the benefit of some of this, I've seen a lot of the negative too, and perhaps a quality improvement might be showing the impact on the physician's um, well-being that they have to be online uh, so, so much and anticip anticipation of that. I have colleagues who are late into the evening uh, trying to respond or else they uh, have to just finally say, no, I can't respond, that the nurse is gonna have to do it. So um, it would be interesting if maybe we, um, you could talk about how to develop a project like that because everyone looks at the positive effect on patients and aren't looking at the negative effect on uh, doctors who may not want to be on um, the internet uh, so many hours per day. So any comments about that aspect of it? Great question, doctor. Um, when we are developing a plan for quality improvement, feasibility is a part of that. And planning the resources that, you know, uh, having available resources for that to be able of um, moving forward with the plans is very important. And I fully understood your concern. You know, the, the, the solution in environments like us that we have limited people around to assign this type of activities to them is using, using templates that provide information for patients in, in, in important priorities and um, concerns. For example, if we know that all of people have a concern about pain, pain management after the surgery, after a specific surgery. We can assign a group of residents to develop a good guideline for the, for the patients about pain management after uh, post-operative, uh, for example, um, uh, surgery about a specific, a specific condition. Or if we know that a part of patient's concern is, for example, if infections or uh, uh, superimposive nosocomial infection, or we know that a part of their uh, problem is abscess formation after this surgery. So we can develop something to, to prevent that priority. At least we can assign our residents and fellows to develop some guidelines for the patients and then use those patients in response to a group of people and patients who have similar conditions and problems. That's our role that we can develop some information, categorize and classified information for the patients to reply those. And uh, that would be only, for example, sharing a part of those information with a specific group of patients that has those questions without having you online to reply those questions. Does it make sense? Like that? So we can develop our resources for um, making patients more informed and aware about their medical conditions. Thank you so much for that question. It was good to, to consider the, the feasibility of, of our uh, solutions. And this Dr. is- Can I please. add on this one? Please, please. So uh, I have been uh, involved in QI project in um, uh, primary care and I have, we also faced the uh, same problem. So um, doctor was very busy and, and the practice was very busy as well. And uh, so what we did with um, uh, dealing uh, to deal with this problem was uh, coming, uh, we, we came up with a plan beforehand and we distributed our work among all the staffs from, from the um, uh, staff who checks in the patient to the MA and uh, even the lab technician. That's how like we divided our work and it really decreased the workload from the doctor because we were doing the uh, project on vaccine. So we were depending on the doctor to talk to the patient and, um, you know, try to uh, give them all the information, which was taking like a bunch or like maybe half the time the doctor had with the patient. So um, th that's what, uh, like when we distributed the, um, the work among the staffs, uh, we, we uh, started doing like handouts 
from the uh, we started starting to talk to the patient from the MA like when they go to take their blood pressure and all they started talking and they know little uh, information then when we reached to the doctor the doctor did not have to talk much about it so that's how we kind of distributed and uh, we planned it during our follow-up meetings so if we try to do that i think this problem can be taken care of thank you so much dr practice for sharing your experience this is a part of embedding evidence-based practice in our department this is an immersive experience immersive program that faculty ask residents to develop picot questions that are evidence-based questions and then uh, developing some discussions around these questions with very simple tools here you can see every resident designed a picot question and you may ask me what are picot questions those are scholarly questions that um, people who are working with evidence are trying to uh, identify uh, among a specific patient population and intervention how can change the outcomes comparing with other comparator or comparative intervention so this is the pico questions and we can develop this capacity among our residents that please bring a question and a scholarly question for uh, discussions in our department so you can for example set a time set a specific day for that and then ask everyone about bringing a question and then searching the evidence about it that can be another strategy we have two or three more slides and i'm sorry for time engage with patients and families in evidence-based care and quality improvement that is something interesting that i want you to you know to put your efforts in this way when you are informed about the best available evidence you can share those evidence with patients in an understandable way at least you can make sure you can make sure when you are talking with patients that you are using the best decision for the patients based on the most recent medical evidence having this part this conversation positive conversation is a part of framing language to invite patient about use of evidence so you can you can use these wordings when you're talking with patients and you're training the residents about that that include most recent medical evidence in your discussions with patients so listening to patients understanding the patient's needs and concerns and answering a specific questions that is personalized care if we if we bring this terminology to our discussions with patients we can claim that we have engaged patient and family in evidence-based care and quality improvement discussions and as i told um, navigating people to use reliable resources for their care like the med consult or for example, uh, Mayo Clinic uh, website for informing patient with understandable terminology for patients about their specific conditions. We can do this favor for our patient to navigate them to reliable resources and for shared decision-making process that we don't have time to explain it. And uh, I want to jump this and go to the last slide that is the last key driver, nurturing leadership and creating a culture of continuous learning and evidence-based practice. So uh, encouraging people about uh, learning new evidence, identifying opportunities for quality improvement and for a vision for practice that adopts to a changing evidence environment and supporting champions for for learning and evidence-based care and quality improvement if we have someone in our department that has 
transformative ideas, innovative solutions, and multiple quality improvement projects, we can you know, narrate the story for other people, we can make uh, positive feedbacks for them, and uh, you know, measuring the implementation and impact of, of evidence-based practice regularly, it is very important. And organizational and leadership support always works for these uh, innovative solutions. We reviewed all of these strategies for change, uh with your patience of course and now is the time to activate change drivers in our clinical environment thank you so much for your time and attention and thank you for uh, dedication of your time in this evening to my lecture presentation thank you thank so you. much great and can we get a copy of your slides sure sure doctor we will share all of these in a podcast channel okay sure doctor thank you for joining us i really appreciate all faculty and the doctors fellows and people inside hospital and outside thank you so much for joining us thank you good night thank, thank you. you have a